Acts. If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As I just, just mentioned before, but you probably couldn't hear me very well, we're moving our way through a series on the five solars of the Reformation. These, these definitive points of what it means to be reformed and these five points which the Reformation, or we should say the Reformers, uh, fought and many of them gave their life and, and many of them even in death fought to defend and define and proclaim as what it would mean to be biblical, orthodox, to be evangelical, and soon enough would be to, uh, to be reformed. I've, I've said this a few times over the last few weeks, and I'll probably say it again as we work through this series. The question I get asked more than anything else about our church, and it's a little bit sad, is what does it mean when you say you are Hope Reformed Baptist Church? Everyone understands the hope and the, the Baptist and the church. Most people get stuck on the reform part. So Decided we'd kick off with this series. This is our third weekend. We're going to do Sola Fide again tonight, part two. We looked at Sola Scriptura on night one. And if you've been away for any of the nights previous or all of the nights previous, you've got to go ahead and grab a copy of those discussions. And I'm sure they will be a blessing to you. So when we say Sola Fide, we're saying faith alone. It's a Latin phrase, which means faith alone. And all the solas generally are speaking to, to the exclusivity of the idea. So sola scriptura is scripture alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Solus Christus, which is Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, which is to the glory of God alone. And we're going to make our way through these next week. Uh, sorry, I apologize. Next week's Reformation Sunday. Don't miss next week. And, um, but soon after that, after next week, we're going to look at sola gratia and what it means to be saved by the grace of God alone. But tonight we're still working through the idea of justification by faith alone. If you've got a Bible, I've invited you already go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you've been around the if you've been around this place, this church for any period of time, even just a, a couple of months, then you know that 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the most common place that I will ask an audience to turn to. The most common place is 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 4. So for many of you this is again repetition ad nauseum because we've been here, we've labored this point, and you know this well, but we're going to go over it again, and I'm sure it will be a blessing to you. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and this is toward the very back end of his first epistle. This is only one chapter before the whole thing wraps up in chapter 16. So Paul's going to write this. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So this is a profound uh, two verses here. First Corinthians 15 verse 1 and 2 speak with a lot of verbs about what it means to actually be a Christian. How do we define what that is to be a Christian? And only once in those two verses does Paul actually use the phrase, Believe. It's the only time he uses it is once, and the time that he uses it is he uses it in the negative. He, he says to his audience that you have the potentiality, there's the possibility that you've actually believed in vain. So aside from using that verb once at the end of verse 2, Paul's going to use a bunch of other verbs here about the gospel. Because for Paul, he genuinely believes, and soon enough we know in AD 60, 65, he's going to lay down his life, has his head removed by the Roman emperor, because he believes that the gospel is the way in which people come to our faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel is how people become Saved. In fact, Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul will say in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. The gospel is everything. It's not only the start of the Christian faith, the gospel is the middle and the end. It's always, all the time, every time, the story about Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived sin free, died an atoning substitutionary death on the cross, bore the wrath of God, physically laid in a tomb, and rose physically in a glorious, victorious resurrection. That is the gospel. So that all who would trust in Jesus... All who would lean on him in faith and trust will be saved. Now, the doctrine underpinning that presentation, that little tirade that I just gave you, is called justification by faith alone. 
We are made right before God, not by what we do, not by how many laws we obey, how righteous we can be, how moral we can be, how good Christians we can be, or how bad we are, but we are made right based solely upon the work and the merit of Jesus Christ. So for Paul, and I would present to you that for every true Christian, and the scripture speaks to this unanimously, the gospel is everything. It's not a small thing. It's not a pithy thing. It's not something by which you learn and then you you get over and you mature on past it. The gospel is everything. So Paul starts out and says he's going to remind these Corinthians of the gospel that he preached to them. And these are the verbs he uses, which you received, which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. In other words, to believe in vain is to not receive upon not to stand and not to hold fast to the gospel. Here's the question we're going to look to answer tonight. This is it. If justification is by faith alone, what kind of faith is it by which one can be justified? Is it any old generic faith? Is it basically just, yeah, I'm pretty sure I I went to church one time, Christmas or Easter or somewhere in between at a wedding or a funeral. I'm pretty sure I heard the story of Jesus maybe at RE in school or maybe a pamphlet or a TV program. And I think that basically, yeah, generally speaking, okay, I'll be a Christian. I'll I'll believe in that. Is that that enough? Is that adequate for someone to, in fact, be justified before God? What kind of faith is it that saves? That's the question we're looking at. And Paul would give us these things. He would say, a faith which receives the gospel, a faith which stands on the gospel, a faith which holds fast to the word of the gospel. Otherwise, you believe in vain. It's the reality of of what Paul's getting at here in 1 Corinthians 15. He's not just trying to be poetic for poetic sake. He's trying to layer upon layer upon layer the realization that tacit belief in Jesus as an historical figure is not adequate to save anybody. There's more to it. So when we go on and we read and we move on past verse 2, we're only going to read one more verse or two more verses, I apologize. So Paul goes on and says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is why. This is why 1 Corinthians 15 appears and comes up and is referred to so often in this church as it ought to be. Here is the place in Scripture where the most preeminent apostle of Jesus Christ, the one who wrote more Scripture than any other apostle of Jesus Christ, here it is where he defines for you and me what are those truths, what are those points, what are those non-negotiables of the gospel, what are those things that, as Paul says, are of first importance. And you'll notice that it's all about Jesus. He goes on, he says, I delivered to you as I read already, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. We've got Jesus' life, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Herein is the Gospel, and this is that which is of first importance. Side note. Side note real quick. That means that you can't anathematize someone because they don't baptize the way you do. That means that you can't anathematize someone. Anathematize means you cut them off. They're outside the Christian faith. You you declare them to be heretics or whatever fashionable word you like to use, an apostate or whatever it might be. You can't go ahead and do that because they disagree with you on secondary or tertiary doctrine. That's what that means. It means that as a community of faith, We do hold things pretty strongly and we believe things pretty strongly and I like to think we're founded upon the Word of God. But here are your non-negotiables. Here they are. This reality of God's existence, His Messiah whom He sent, the sin-free life of Jesus, His atoning death, His burial and His glorious resurrection. There it is in its most kernel form, its most irreducible form, the reality of the Gospel. And faith is the only instrument by which we lay hold of the righteousness of Christ. Here is the reality as the predicament, and you've heard this painted so many times before. The reality is that even if you could be the most moral person the world has ever seen, aside from Jesus, of course, there's always that exception, you still will fail to fully accomplish and obey the perfect law of God. In fact, Paul says all have sinned. 
All have fallen short of God's glorious standard. All have failed to honor, worship, and serve God as He has decreed He will be honored, worshiped, and served. So we are in a position as human beings, as, as descendants of Adam and Eve, we're in a position of lostness, of, of depravity. We are in a position of death. And yet Christ, by His merit, by His glorious life, His law-keeping and His substitutionary death in your behalf and in your stead, should you believe, pays the penalty that you deserve. Faith. It's faith. Faith is the instrument by which we lay hold of the righteousness of Christ. Spurgeon tells this story in his book, All of Grace. I'm sure many of you have read it. I've only recommended it about 400 times. And if you haven't read it, get on to it. All of Grace, Charles Spurgeon recommended, let, let, me, let me go stronger, compulsory reading for every Christian. All of Grace by Spurgeon. He tells this story of these two men who were, who were quite thrill-seeking individuals and these kind of guys that are always uh, shooting after an adrenaline and, and going after a thrill. And they decided that they were going to try and ride the rapids that end up descending into Niagara Falls in, in the U.S., so they're on, they're on these rapids and they're trying to uh, navigate their way and Spurgeon tells the story that soon enough the entire vessel that they've pretty much uh, secured themselves to is broken apart and they are completely helpless as they're thrashed around in this water just about to descend over the massive waterfall. And onlookers are, are distressed and onlookers are freaking out and, and they throw, thankfully, they, they throw a lifeline. They, they, they throw a rope. Out to these men, and both men, grab, both men grab the rope as tight as they can. You can imagine the, the fear and the dread and the, and the panic that these men have as they tightly clench this, this rope. They probably never grabbed something this tight. And as they're holding this rope, generally speaking, they're safe. They can be pulled into shore and, and, and brought into, into safety. But one of the individuals, and this is, as far as I know, this is a true story. One of the individuals, as he's tightly clenched this rope, notices a big beam, like a, like a tree trunk, begins to float majestically past him. And immediately upon realizing that he holds this tiny rope and, and the rope looks small and it looks weak and it looks frail, he lets go of the rope and clutches the beam. After all, the beam's bigger, it's stronger, it's heavier. The beam looks like it's faring better in the rapids. Well, the man who tightly kept the rope clenched was drawn into shore safety and the tragedy of the story is you know the end. The man who held the beam went sailing over the waterfall and plummet to his death. And how often we see this as Spurgeon draws out the, the, the analogy, Spurgeon draws out the reality of what the, the metaphor is trying to teach. How often do we see this in Christianity? As we look inside ourselves and we notice that our faith is often weak, it's often, it often seems to be wavering, it often seems to be struggling as we're day to day embattled with doubt and, 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 and the thoughts that come from the enemy and the sin which besets and all these things we're fighting all the time. It looks like faith is a very narrow cord. And sometimes things begin to sail past us in the rapid of life and they look big, they look sturdy, they look heavy, they look reliable. But this is how Spurgeon drew out this, this analogy as he began to talk that although faith may look thin, although faith may look pliable, although faith may look like it's weak, if it is attached to a source of safety and life, it can save. It can save. And how many people who start out in the Christian faith have, have no issue taking the label of Christian, perhaps they go ahead and get baptized, perhaps they join a church and do all those outward things that make them appear Christian, soon enough they clutch the large, heavy, appearingly dominant log of works. And soon enough, whilst they may have started out in the Christian life fully believing and trusting and having faith in Jesus Christ, they soon enough are relying on their works and their morality and their internal sense of ethic and achievement. This is the devastating reality of many Christians today. Only those who are trusting in Jesus Christ are actually justified by Jesus Christ. Let me, let me make this really clear because we've been saying this over the last two weeks now that, that, that those who are saved and those who are ushered into the presence of God and those who will live gloriously in heaven with God forever are justified by faith alone. But let me be really clear, faith doesn't save. Jesus saves. 
What makes faith the instrument of salvation or the conduit is that faith unites someone to Jesus Christ. So how often, I don't know about you, but I'll, I'll speak openly of myself. How often do I look inside and look at my faith and just wonder to myself, how can this seemingly wavering and often weak and doubting faith save me? How could it justify me? But it's always the object of faith. It will always be before our attention, the majestic, holy, inconquerable, perfect Jesus Christ. If your faith is in Christ, not good works, not achievements, not morality, not religiosity, if it's in Christ, it can save. Because all those things will condemn. The righteousness of Christ is the ground of our justification. And this righteousness, as we stressed last week, remember we spoke about this last week, this righteousness is imputed to us when we trust Jesus alone for salvation. Imputed is kind of a, it's a bit of a fanciful theological term, but it means it's credited. You and I both know that the day we start trusting Jesus, the Spirit comes and abides and there's a dramatic change in our life. But I don't know about you, if you're honest enough to admit this, we still have sin. We still wrestle. Much to the disappointment of some, you wake up the next day and there's those sins again ready to fight. And some people genuinely believe that, well, when I start believing in Jesus, when when I start being a Christian, that fight is over. That's just not true. The reality is that the righteousness of Christ is credited to us so that when we stand before God, He doesn't see you and He doesn't see your sin. He sees His perfect Son, Jesus Christ, and He calls you righteous. He declares you righteous. This is what imputation means, that it's that which God credits to your account. The Father then declares us righteous in His sight, enabling us to inherit eternal life. This is accomplished entirely apart from any works by which we perform. All works, all reliance upon works, all reliance upon any religion or anything like that, any form of superstition or morality-based religion will cause people to die. Only saving faith saves. So then the question naturally arises, what is saving faith? What does that look like? What kind of faith is saving faith? Faith, true faith always leads to a changed life. Always leads to a changed life. The Protestant reformers grappled and they they wrestled with this and they, they wrestled with the way in which Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel which you receive, which you stand upon, which you hold fast to. How do we think about these verbs? And, and how do we think about faith in light of these, these very dramatic and aggressive verbs? We, we hold the gospel. We stand on it firmly. We trust it and we, we grip it tight. How do, we, how do we think about this? And the Protestant reformers broke this down into three categories. Three essentials to faith that must be necessary in order for it to be true faith. And these three, I'll give you the Latin words and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some English variation of them. First is notitia, the second is a census, and the third is fiducia. Notitia, a census, fiducia. This was formulated by the Protestant reformers so as to demonstrate that it's not just any pithy faith, this has to be biblical, saving faith to be justifiable. The first one we look at, that's, um, the first one is notitia. Notitia refers to the content of faith. That's why when Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 15 about the gospel, which we receive, on which we stand, by which we hold fast, Paul then goes on to describe those details, those things of first importance. The the gospel of Jesus Christ and saving faith has content to it. You you ever met those kind of Christians where it's it's almost like you begin speaking to them, yeah, I'm a a, a Christian. What does that mean for you? Well, I I, I, I I, I just believe Jesus was a good guy. Uh, a bit of a reformer, a bit of an anti-authoritarian kind of revolutionary. I, I like Jesus. And you stood there scratching your head wondering, what on earth is this person on about? Whilst that all may be true, that's not the data of the gospel. That's not the content. The content of the gospel is the God man, Jesus Christ, living sin free and dying as an atonement for those who would believe. The gospel that saves has content to it. And that content is non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. 
It's not up to you to decide what happened in history and who Jesus is and how you'd like him to be. I've had people say this, well, I just think of Jesus like this. That's nice. That's nice that you think of Jesus like that, but what do the scriptures say? Who is he according to God's revelation? That's what I want to know. So the first point we look at saving faith is notitia. It's the content of faith. When you trust in something, you have details, you have information, you have a basic knowledge of what it is you're trusting in. The second one we look at is a census, which is really the conviction that the content of the faith is true. Let me say something that may appear for the majority of you to be kind of, to be kind of, to be kind of, let me say something that may appear to be a little bit unnecessary. The gospel is not a metaphor. I've, I've met Christians like this. Well, you know, Jesus, the whole living under Roman rule, dying on the cross, going on the grave, rising again. I just think this just, I just, it's just, it's just a really nice myth. And these people are calling themselves Christians. As if we've got some great story from, from, from happy ever after, never, never land that never actually happened. And it doesn't matter if it happened, as long as we maintain the, the metaphor, as long as, we, as long as we really juice out of the story what the morality by which we want to live. This is complete and utter garbage. Not only are the historical facts of Jesus true, verifiable, and demonstrative, but they are necessary to the gospel presentation necessary to the gospel presentation. There was a real man, Jesus Christ, who claimed to be God. He claimed to be able to forgive sins. He wrought miracles. And then he died on a cross and proclaimed that you will put me to death and I will be risen back to life. And everything he stated came to be truth. Historic truth. Not a fairy tale, not a metaphor, not an analogy. Saving faith doesn't just understand the content of the gospel. Saving faith says the content of the gospel is true. It's true. It happened. It's, it's real human history. It's God intervening in the human story and rendering salvation possible by Jesus Christ, His Son. The third one and the last one of the, which the Protestant reformers articulated as necessary for saving faith is fiducia. So we had, we had noticia, that's the data, the content. We had a census, that is to give assent, that is to believe in the the truth content of the gospel. Jesus did actually die. Jesus did actually rise. And the third one is, in fact, that which brings trust. The gospel is not the kind of take it and leave it story. It's not just there to be, well, stack it among all the great historical tales and, and leave it there as it is. The gospel story has to be trusted. In order for someone to have faith which justifies saving faith, They've got to approach the gospel and see in it the truth content and say, that's for me. That's true for me. To be able to to hear the gospel proclaim a dying saviour, a Messiah who lays down his life on the cross for the sins of his people and for you to be able to say, he died for me. There are my sins imputed to him. He's nailed on the tree. He bears the wrath of God that I deserve. He dies and is risen for me. Saving faith doesn't say things like, well, he died for someone. One day I hope to meet that person. I don't know who it is, but I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus died. I believe Jesus rose. I've got, it's got nothing to do with me. I don't know how that affects my life at all. Saving faith trusts. Remember the story of the, the men in the rapids who are fastly drowning and descending down the fall? He grips the cord tightly, and that's what saving faith does. He doesn't first say, what cord? I mean, I can see a cord, but it's just a metaphor, really. It's a metaphor for me having a bad day. He holds the cord. He grips the cord. He he holds fast to it, as Paul uses the language in 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel is something which you receive, you stand upon it, and you hold fast to it. And Paul says, if you don't, you have believed in vain. This is the faith of which is wrought by the Holy Spirit and which brings justification. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bible somewhere else real quick as we close out our talk this evening. This is James chapter 2. You really can't do a discussion on justification by faith alone without going to James chapter 2. Now, James chapter 2 has caused a lot of headaches 
a lot of headaches. In fact, Martin Luther, who very much is seen by, by many people as the springboard to the Reformation, the man who which launched this entire political and social and religious movement, he once said that he hated little James and he wished he could throw him into the fire. He called James the epistle of straw. A, in other words, meaning he couldn't hold nothing up. He he didn't like James, but I'm going to... I mean, and Luther, yes, he, he went through some change and realized what he was saying was incorrect, but I can understand his frustration. At a bare reading of this, it seems to imply that everything I've spoken about tonight and last week is completely bunk. That's how it seems. So let's have a look. We're going to start our reading at verse 14. This is what James writes. What good is it, my brethren, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, the faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And it goes on to continue and speak of uh, Rahab and these other examples. And it continues to speak in such a way. And the last verse here, 26, at the last part, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, verse 26, so also faith apart from works is dead. This particular passage in the New Testament has caused no small amount of real consternation, real frustration, real difficulty. As James appears, at least at the surface, to be saying the absolute opposite of what Paul is clearly saying so often in the Bible, Galatians and and Romans and Corinthians, as we already read, there seems to be a real diametric opposition here between these two ideas. And many people have struggled with this and they've said things like, well, if we're holding to sola fide, justification by faith alone, then why does James say one is not justified by faith alone? What on, what on earth is going on here? As you look at least surface level, there appears to be a contradiction. But I want to submit to you this evening that in the first verse, in the first verse, the entire thing can easily be harmonized if you just look close enough. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Good question. Then he asks another, can that faith save him? Can that faith save him? Rhetorical question, the answer is obviously no. In other words, there is a kind of believing, there is, there is a kind of faith that's nothing more than demonic faith, then that's the faith of demons themselves. As James will go on and say, the demons believe and they shudder. And he's speaking facetiously. In other words, what is wrong with you? The demons believe, they've, they've got faith, are you going to call them justified? Are they, are they saved by the meritorious sacrifice of Jesus? Is that what you're going to say about demons? Of course you're not. So James argues that there is a type of faith that cannot, there is a type of faith that cannot save because that type of faith cannot produce works. So as we've asked the question this evening, what kind of faith justifies? What what kind of faith does the Spirit implant in the heart of those of whom the Spirit regenerates? What kind of faith is that? The most obvious answer is when we go to Corinthians and James and throughout the entire Bible, that kind of faith is a faith which brings forth fruit. It brings forth fruit works. It, it's active faith. It, it, it isn't dormant. It isn't lethargic. It doesn't sit back and do nothing. It acts. It moves. It brings forth fruit. 
So we must think about this and we must understand that when the Bible says we're justified by faith alone, and then the Bible says, don't say you're, uh, James says, don't say you're justified by faith alone because faith of that works is dead. We understand they're talking about a specific type of faith. A specific type of faith. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 speaks so strongly with all these profound verbs that the faith that that clings to Jesus, it does so by standing firm and not believing in vain. The faith that that the Spirit brings into our heart bears fruit. It acts, it moves, it is life. We might go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. And I believe Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, if we kind of think about Paul speaking in Romans and Galatians and and stressing the idea of being justified by faith alone, not according to law, not according to works. And the other side, you've you've kind of got James almost appearing at least to say the opposite. Your justification is not by faith alone because faith that doesn't produce works is is dead. We think about these two realities crescendoing and, and peaking at this top, and, and that top really is Ephesians 2. We read this in verse 8. Paul says, and you all know this verse so well, for by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see that side of the pyramid now? There's Paul. There's the profound statement of the reformers and and evangelical Christians and even historic believers that we are justified by the work of Jesus, not our works. Lest anyone may boast, Paul says. And then Paul goes on in verse 10, we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not a result of works, but for... For good works, which God, prepared, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The faith which saves, the faith which justified is an active faith, but the works are the fruit and not the root of justification. To confuse those two is to make complete shipwreck of your faith. One does not come into right standing before God because they've amounted or earned or merited or done enough good things or good deeds or whatever it might be. One comes into right standing before God because of the meritorious life and death of Jesus the Messiah. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of you. It's not your doing. Not according to works. No one may boast. But we're his workmanship. And we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Unto good Works. That's why James says, can that kind of faith save you? He's not asking about Christian faith. He's asking about false faith, fruitless faith, dead faith, as he says. Can dead faith save? Absolutely not. But that faith which comes upon hearing the gospel and upon hearing, receiving, and upon receiving, standing, and upon standing, holding fast, that faith brings forth Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's so easy to get the balance out of whack here. It's so easy to get the the cart before the horse or or to, to turn the tables and mess this up. It's so easy to speak in such a way as to kind of to, to mess up the idea, but works are always the fruit of salvation. They are never the source of it. The faith which comes upon hearing. And hearing upon the word of God, that faith saves. It justifies. And that faith always brings forth fruit. And if it doesn't, it's dead. You are to repent and trust Jesus Christ. Would you close in prayer with me this evening as we ask God to bless our time around the word? We do thank you, God, that you are a holy God. We thank you, Father, that you are just, you are righteous, you are merciful. Your majesty, Father, is incomparable. You are peerless. You are glorious. You are the Holy One. And as we come before you, Father, we recognize that we could never earn right standing before you. You are that perfect. 
You are that infinitely holy. We could never earn a state of justification. So Father, I thank you for your son. Your own precious son who came here, who lived that sin-free life that we failed to live. Who died that death of the criminal that we ought to have died and who in doing that prepared a way for us. A way by which we can stand before you, God. Stand before you clothed in the righteousness of Christ as Jesus once stood before you clothed in our sin and died because of it. And I thank you, Father, that the scripture is fulfilled that you made Christ who you know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of him. We thank you, Father, for the gospel. We thank you, Father, that true saving faith is a faith which clings tightly to Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that our encouragement tonight is that it, our faith may waver, our faith may be weak, we may be struggling with our faith, but Jesus is always able to save to the uttermost all of those who come under him. That is the perfect, the eternal, the inconquerable high priest. And I thank you, Father, as we've been, we've been sh shaken awake by James as we've read him this evening, Father. We've, we've thought about his implication that if our faith doesn't and isn't bringing forth fruit, we ought to abandon that and truly trust in Jesus Christ. We ought to be ready to acknowledge if we've been false believers. We ought to be ready to be acknowledged, Father, if we've been deceived. And we ought to cling to Jesus Christ and bring forth that fruit created in Him for good works. Because we are your workmanship. We thank you for this, Father. We thank you for the gospel. In and of ourselves, we have no hope, no life. We have only death and darkness. But in your dear Son, Father, who rose from the dead who conquered sin and death and brought newness to life. I thank you, Father, that in him we can be saved. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.